Okay, I think I'm sharing. You are sharing. Okay, cool. Now I was going to ask if you can hear me, but apparently you can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So yeah, in this talk, um, what I'm going to kind of go through is there's like a really cool proof technique that you can use for certain types of tiling puzzles. And there's also like another cool thing about it is the way in which it fails, like the way in which you cannot use it for some tiling problems. And there's like, in some sense, like an even cooler like way to get around it. And this is one of the things that John Conway um, did. And then Jeff Ligarius, who was a professor at U of M, U of M kind of expanded upon. Uh, and then there's like also like Bill Thurston wrote a paper and I'll give you like some references at the end, but uh, there's kind of like a cool sequence of work that um, uh, kind of like came out of this idea of John Conway's. I think it was originally just John Conway's. Uh, and uh, as Sarah noted, I'll point out uh, the highlight so far in my life before this talk, but um, this talk will be pretty good too. Okay, so let's um, look at this. So this, I think this puzzle is actually, it's, I think it's one of the most well-known mathy puzzles. I'm not sure about that, but like, I think Martin Gardner um, popularized it. And I just have the sense that it's pretty well-known. The puzzle is that you start with a checkerboard and you remove two um, diagonally, whatever, diagonally facing, diagonally opposite um, cells. And then you then have like some dominoes. Obviously you can have as many as you want. And you're allowed to, you know, use them in either orientation. And the question is like, can you tile the entire checkerboard without those two squares using these dominoes? And I wonder, does anybody know what the answer to this puzzle is? You guys feel free to type your, your comments and questions in the chat as usual. Yeah, I have a weird setup where I'm like using an iPhone and an iPad. Uh, yeah, so like a bunch of people said it's impossible. Does anybody know? And it's true. So I'll also give you a little spoiler, but like every tiling I present in this full talk is gonna be impossible. Um, so just kind of <laughs> stipulate that off of that. Does anybody know why it's um, impossible? Each domino covers one white and one black square and you have not the same number of white and black squares. Yeah, that's exactly right. So every domino, no matter how you place it in whatever orientation, so like here in this vertical orientation, you can place it like here or here and that's basically it or in the a horizontal orientation, you can paste, place it here or here, it always covers, so this always covers one white, one black square. But this thing doesn't have an equal number of white squares and black squares because it did before we removed these two um, opposite cells, uh, but now it has uh, 30 white squares and 32 black squares. So that's it. So it's impossible. And it turns out you can solve actually quite a, a few other puzzles um, uh, with a sort of similar technique. So here's one which uh, I'm curious if you know. I actually didn't know this puzzle until I was kind of preparing for this talk. But in this puzzle, you have a 10, so this is a 10 by 10 checkerboard. And here, as you can see, like no squares are removed, it's just like the full thing, 10 by 10. And what you have to work with are these uh, kind of L tetrominoes that um, like kind of Tetris pieces sort of things. And so you can see they cover like three and then one. And just like before, you can like, excuse me, you can do it in any orientation. So per my stipulation, this is also impossible. Um, does anybody happen to know? Oh, I didn't see it. That's okay, Mike. There, there, yeah, so Jonah has a question from the previous checkerboard. Is the tiling always possible if you cut away one white and one black from the board? Do you know? Oh, yeah, that is true. Um, yeah, so that's, um, I don't really deal in possibility proofs. That's not really my thing. But yes, that is possible. If you like <laughs> remove this, um, I think I can actually find it probably on the Wikipedia page for Maybe I have it. Yeah, 
so like here, well, I can't point because this is, I'm no longer in that thing, but so uh, in this thing on Wikipedia, you can see a proof where there's a circuit which covers the entire board. And if you remove two, if you move a black square and a white square, you'll then like have that circuit broken, broken up to a number of pieces. Because you removed on a white and black square, you'll always be able to place dominoes like around that circuit and tile the rest of the board. And this is, according to Wikipedia, called Gomori's theorem. One of the other things, like, there's also something about like, what if you remove like two white squares and two black squares? And people have figured out this, but I think there's actually like, once you get past a certain point, there's like no longer like snappy answers. So it's just like some weird thing you just have to figure out yourself. Oops. Okay. Um, yeah, I actually like the way I have it set up. I'm probably not going to notice uh, texts, so you might want to. I'll, I'll I'll try to interrupt you. I I was I was slow on getting to that one too. I'll, I'll do better. Cool. Um, so yeah. Uh, so I didn't know what this was, and I have no idea actually how you would figure this out. Um, it seems like they come out of nowhere for me. If anybody knows, please let me know. But here's the coloring quote unquote that you can use. So you color all these ones with the number one and you color these with the number five and then you repeat. I won't do the whole thing. I'll just do a few more rows. I'll stop after this one. So it just goes on like this for the whole, the rest of the thing. Now, what happens when you cover this board with a tile? Well, so like here, what's the, what's the sum of these? It's one plus one plus one plus five, which is eight. Here, it's five plus five plus five plus one, which is 16. And you can see as you move it around in any orientation, in any orientation, you always get one plus one plus five or five plus five plus one, no matter what you do. So particular, it's um, always divisible by eight. But then what's the sum of, what's the sum of numbers in the row, uh, sorry, in the, in the region? Well, so here, this is, So here, this is um, six times 10, and there's five groupings of this. So the uh, total is six times 10 times five, which is not there's a light, uh, because there's only, there's one, two here, and one, two here, that's it. Um, so yeah, so that's it. I have no idea how you come up with that, but this is a sort of similarly flavored solution to a puzzle. And I kind of want to extract out what the exact common core is. And one way you can extract out an exact common core is, okay, I guess not moving that. Oh, I can erase it. I can bring it there. So one way you can extract it out is by saying, okay, the cells are colored, colored with like one or five mod eight. So this means um, you, you use like modular arithmetic, which is like sort of this clock arithmetic sort of thing. And the sum of a cell is always zero. But sum of the region is non-zero. And you can is poor space management, but you can also fit the previous puzzle into that as well. If instead, because before we were dealing with like light and black squares, if you instead like just put one or minus one, it'll work out to be the same thing where tiles always sum to zero, but the region doesn't. So this is the proof technique that I want to talk about. And this is, I just sort of rewrote what I just said. Um, there's actually more ways to formalize what this is. This is actually more of a specific way than it's done in the Conway-Ligarius paper, but this is fine for this talk. So 
the argument is you assign something to each cell. It can be an integer, like the first puzzle. It can be something mod, some other number. It could even be like a, a vector, which is necessary for some of these puzzles. Um, it can be, so like, it's, what, what's really here is like anything in some abelian group, um, if you know what that is. But if you don't, it's just something you can add in some reasonable way. Then you observe that the sum of the cells in each tile is zero in any orientation or location. And then you observe the sum of the cells in the whole region is non-zero and say, well, okay, that's it, that's done. So it's pretty slick, it's pretty neat. And then the question is, can you always do it? Like when you have some impossible tiling, can you always pick some number-like object and some assignment of number-like objects in order to demonstrate that that tiling is impossible? And the answer is no. And I'm actually not sure if like, maybe if this was explicitly mentioned first in this Conway Ligarius paper, it definitely is explicitly mentioned there. I'm not sure if it was the first time or not, but they definitely said like, here's some tiling that's like, you know, you, you might think you could just use a coloring argument, but you can't, it's, it's not possible. So here we have a triangular grid, uh, nine on a side, and the tile is three in a row, which you can orient in these ways. So like one way to think about this tiling is you could do it like, you kind of like just draw three in a row like this. You know, you start a tiling like this. So it's not possible to complete this, but you can't prove with the color argument. Um, cool. So do you guys have like, what do you think is harder to prove? That you can't prove it with a coloring argument or that, um, uh, that it can't be done? Okay, Drew thinks that, but you think it's harder to prove that you can't prove it or harder to prove that you can't, call, can't tile it? Well, Drew says two, I mean one, and then Jonah says no coloring argument seems harder. Soren says one, Zach says um, triangle, triangle, and Soren says yeah. <laughs> uh, correct. I, so the, the answer is yeah, you, um, it's actually like, well, it, so it's easy. <laughs> it's easy to prove that no coloring argument will work once you are sort of handed this diagram, which comes out of nowhere, this actually like looks, I was curious, so I was like, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain what this diagram is. I was like, well, what, where did Conway and Ligaris come up with this? And so like in the original Conway Ligaris paper, it just, it says like, well, this is easy to find. And I was like, well, is it really easy to find? I actually meant before, uh, before this talk to like kind of chew it from memory, see if I could like reconstruct it. I didn't do it, but I think it's like an interesting experiment because um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I think this is easy to find. But let me tell you what this is first. So this is uh, what Conway and Ligarius call assigned tiling. So this means you are allowed to use antimatter tiles. And you just have to have for every cell number of regular tiles covering it minus the number of antimatter tiles equals one. And so all these things, actually like almost all these, these are all regular tiles. There's exactly one anti-tile right here. And so you can see that if you ignore this thing here, all three of these guys are covered by two regular tiles. This, one's, this one is covered by this and this. This one's covered by this and this, covered by this and this. And then you, and then they, Conway and Ligarius place one anti-tile over this. And so this like kind of makes it, uh, so like one net tile is covering these things. And then the claim is like that this shows that no coloring argument can, um, can prove that there is no tile. There is no tiling of this triangular region. Um, can you guys see why that's true? Doesn't it have to do with the fact that like, if you treat an antimatter tile, like if you assign the numberings and um, an antimatter tile just get, gets negative numberings, if the sum of each tile were z zero, then the sum of the whole thing would be zero. Yep, uh, that's exactly right. And I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, is a covering argument always possible for certain types of regions? Like say for a square, is a covering argument always possible? 
Um, I think I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, maybe I know it, but uh, I can't think of it right now. I think I don't know. I think I'd have to think about that and, and back, get back to you. There are like certain criteria that, it, like even in the Conrad Gary's paper, for, like when can you use a coloring argument? I'm not sure they apply to like uh, things like um, what is the shape of the region. Mm -hmm. Cool. So yeah. So this is this is the answer. So a coloring argument. As someone who I, I apologize, I, I couldn't read the name because I'm using my iPhone. Um, a coloring argument would also prove there's no sign tiling. It's a sign tiling, so there can be a color argument. Okay, well, there you go. Also, I don't know if uh, any eagle-eyed people noticed, but uh, this, this uh, Triangular region actually has eight, um, not nine, like I claimed. Uh, that's like couldn't kind of couldn't find the right figure that I wanted, but you can, I think, let's see if you can just continue it with three things like this. Okay, so great. So they proved that the existing kind of cool chip trick doesn't work. So now they have to come up with another cool trick to prove that the tiling is impossible. Uh, and now, well, and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you what that what that technique is. Um, I'm going to start by showing you how it works with a simpler problem. So this problem is to prove the impossibility of tiling a four by four square with these things, which are called skewed tetrominoes. And this problem is actually like really easy to solve by hand. Um, it's if you like just when you try it, you see there's like very few possibilities and they just don't work. Like there's a corner thing, there's a corner square here. And so like, it has to be something like this. And then you kind of like, this thing kind of has to be like this. And then, uh, like, I guess you can say this, but there's just very few possibilities. You can just like check it. Um, but the reason why I'll show it using some method is that, of course, this other method will generalize to the triangle case. Okay. So to describe this method, I have to tell you about two cities, which are very alike in some ways and very unlike in other ways. Both of these cities, Hoboken and Manhattan, have a grid system on which you can travel. They have some parallel roads called streets in both cases. And they have some parallel roads called avenues in both cases. Um, the difference is that in Hoboken, the direction of travel for all the avenues is the same. So the direction of travel for cars, all the avenues are the same. And the direction of travel for streets is all the same. Whereas in Manhattan, Along one avenue, cars go one way, and along another avenue, the kind of adjacent avenue, cars go another way, and they continue to alternate. And the same thing for streets. Cars go um, east on this street and west on this street, and east on this street and west on this street. By the way, this isn't true. Like, this would be a ridiculous uh, city planning thing, because you could actually never drive from here to here. But let's just say that this is true. Now, you are not a, you, you don't have a car. You're just a humble pedestrian and you like to go for walks. You live in Hoboken and you like to go for walks. So you start here and you walk around and you come back. Your walks might cross themselves. You might go double back on yourself, doesn't matter. And you have a friend in Manhattan who maybe starts here and your friend wants to kind of walk along a similar route as you. So you have like a, you have a, the cell phone, you're talking to them, or maybe you're, you're texting her or something. But the thing is, when you describe the way that you walk, all you say is whether or not you're going along a street or an avenue, and whether you're going with the traffic or against the traffic. So let's look at an example. The simplest, kind of the simplest example is like, what happens if you just walk around the block? So you start here, you go up, you go over, 
you come back. So what does your Manhattan friend do? No, it's a good place to start. Okay, so first you say, oh, well, I'm walking along the street for one block with the traffic. And your Manhattan friend says, oh, okay, well, I'll do that. Then you say, okay, I'm walking along an avenue with the traffic. And your Manhattan friend says, okay, but now on her avenue, the traffic is going this way, so she goes down with this. Then you say, okay, now I'm walking one street against the traffic. And your Manhattan friend says, okay. And then you say, finally you say, okay, now I'm walking one avenue against the traffic. And your Manhattan friend says, okay, well. So one thing to notice is that you made a closed loop and you ended up where you started, but your Manhattan friend didn't. So it's like there's no particular property that this path has to have given some property of this path, except for of course it has to be the same length. Now, let's suppose that um, as naturally you would, you decide to walk on the path which is the border of a skew tetramino. So you start here, you walk here, walk up. Okay, so that's the, I should really be putting arrows in. These are all like kind of, you have a direction to the way you're walking. I sometimes forget to do that though. Okay, so now what does your Manhattan friend do? So, well, so first you walked um, two blocks along the street with the traffic. Then you walked one block along an avenue with the traffic. Then you blocked one block along a street um, with the traffic and now the Manhattan person is going this way because the direction of traffic is different in Manhattan. Then uh, you walked one avenue with traffic, just like this. Then you walked two avenues against traffic on a street. Sorry, you walked two blocks against traffic on a street. Whoa. Um, and then you walked uh, one block against traffic on an avenue, one block against traffic on a street, one block against traffic on an avenue, which is this. Okay, so since we want to prove something about skew tetrominoes, it'll be useful if there's something special about this path that we can use to help us. Um, can anyone guess what a special thing about this path might be? Closed path, like a loop path. Yeah, exactly. So like, yeah, as I just demonstrated, like a path doesn't always have to be closed. When you like walk in Hoboken, the path of Manhattan doesn't have to be closed all the time. But this path is closed. So that's cool. Like, can we do something with that? And yes, we can. So the claim is that if in Hoboken, you walk around the boundary of any region tileable by skew tetrominoes, then in Manhattan, your friend is going to return to where she started, walk around a closed path. And the proof is actually like, uh, I wouldn't want to say it's obvious because when, when I read it, I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be some difficult proof, but it actually is like kind of like a state of mind instead of a proof. It's kind of weird. Um, so you can prove it by induction on the size of R. This means you prove it by induction on the number of tiles you need to tile this region R. The base case with one tile has been shown already, although actually we would have to do it in more different orientations um, and locations to show it fully, but I think you can believe that there's enough symmetry in Hoboken and Manhattan, that it's pretty believable. For the induction step, suppose that we have some region tiled by like n uh, tetrominoes, q tetrominoes, and uh, we know it's true for all regions of um, uh, lower um, area, lesser area. So suppose you're starting at some point, yeah. I'll call this point P, then you can pick out some tetram tetromino in the tiling that's kind of adjacent to where you're starting and say, okay, now I can divide this region into one region consisting of just this tetromino and the rest of it. And by the induction, induction hypothesis, we know, let me name uh, this point Q. By the induction hypothesis, we know that if we travel around this path, and now here I'm just going right here, that's gonna lead to a closed path in Manhattan. 
And we know that if we travel around this path, that's gonna to lead to a closed path in Manhattan. So just to draw schematically, I just kind of, I'm just repeating what I just said. So if we travel along this path, to Q, then travel along this shorter one, that's a closed path. And that's a closed path. So at the end of this, and uh, these are supposed to be the same thing, except for I can't really draw that. It's supposed to be like you're going here and then coming back on the same path. So the end result of that is a closed path because you're just, um, you're doing one closed path and then following with another one. But the, the fact that you went from here and then back actually has no relevance. Like you're just going somewhere and then retracing your steps. So you can actually just remove it and conclude that just the path when you walk all the way around the region is closed. And that's the induction step. Cool. Um, does anybody know why this claim might be quite useful to us? I don't remember if I said this or not. Like why is this like potentially like we're getting some really good information out of this, uh, this walking thing, this walking idea. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we now have a, um, we have a criterion because we say, well, okay, I know that if I can, um, if I walk around the boundary of a region to Holloway, to Scooter Thomas in Hoboken, in Manhattan, I walk around a closed path. So if I, if I do the walk and in Manhattan is not closed, well, then I know it's not tileable. So this is a criterion we can use. That's great. So let's give it a try. So I'll start here. And I walk around my square region. And what does my Manhattan friend do? So she starts here and she walks, okay, walks four blocks along a street. Then, and then she walks four blocks along an out, uh, okay, four blocks along an avenue. Then she walks four blocks against this traffic uh, on the street and then four blocks against the traffic in, um, uh, on a street. Okay, so it didn't quite work. It did work to prove that the region with just one cell can't be uh, tiled by a scooter terminal. I mean, it's not very impressive, but we, you, know, you can use this to prove some things can't be tiled by scooter terminals, but it didn't work. It didn't work for this square, this four by four square. So we have to, but we're, this is actually, we're still on the right track. This is like a, still a very good property. Um, yeah, uh, that, I think that's true. It is like, it is still all less impressive because all the odd squares can't be tiled for car, like just because the scooter almost have even numbers of squares. So even though that entire class is still not that impressive. But, um, but yeah, let's take another look at, uh, let me erase this for now. Let's kind of hide away our shameful failure and look again at um, what happens when you walk along a street to, to terminal. So I don't go the whole, through the whole thing, I'll just rely on my amazing memory skills. So let me draw in the arrows. And I don't know, can anybody see anything else which is like special? special about this path that we could use, um, we could try and exploit in some way. It's composed of two closed paths, maybe? Yeah, um, yeah. So definitely it's like quite conspicuous that like, well, it seems to be circling this uh, path here and also seems to be circling this path here. Um, we can like try and push that through it's gonna be a little bit weird because like, if it was true, like, oh, it's always gonna circle two paths. Um, we know like when we add these together, like, well, cause we're gonna put like more scooter tunnels like on top of like together to get a tiling. It's gonna be like some multiple of two maybe. And then it's maybe gonna like still not prove it because the square um, has a multiple of two, um, the four by four square has a multiple of two squares inside it. But one thing which um, will work that we build on this idea is if we notice that the path is circling this square in a counterclockwise direction and this square 
in a clockwise direction. And that might lead one to think, if one happened to know the answer to this already, that um, if you have, <clears throat> if you measure uh, for a given closed path, you measure the number of squares that it circles counterclockwise and subtract from it the number of squares it circles clockwise, that would be an interesting invariant. And you might also know this because this actually is not just some random property which was made up for this puzzle. This is just like the notion of a signed area of an oriented curve in the plane. And let me just take a second to tell you a little bit more carefully what that means. So stepping back, this is actually not just about tiling. This is, uh, excuse me. This is a like just concept to do with any sort of curve in the plane. Oh, that's some restrictions probably. Uh, I meant to say oriented here. And close. Um, so you can, given just any like sort of random oriented closed curve in the plane, you can measure the net number of times that curve winds around a point. This is called the winding number of that curve around a point. This is the picture from Wikipedia, by the way, just basically. There. So here's the curve, here's some point. And the way that you can measure that is you kind of say, um, you just like draw a ray that takes this point to the outside world. So I'll start here and just draw it to the outside world. And then you just measure the number of times the curve crosses it. So here we can see that um, this is one counterclockwise crossing. This is another counterclockwise crossing. So this is, uh, this is a winding number of two. And then the thing which makes this a, a real definition is it doesn't matter where you draw this ray. Um, you probably have to be like careful at like singular points maybe. You can just try and like move your ray so it doesn't have, it doesn't cross those, or maybe it's fine, I don't know. So if you draw it like this, then you have one counterclockwise crossing to, wait, what is this? Three counterclockwise crossings and one clockwise. So this is three minus one, which is still two, this is just two. So this is a measure which is actually like useful in a number of different things, um, in particular complex analysis, but many things. Um, of how often a curve winds around a point. Then, in the case of, and this is again, I should have said some more things here, like this is oriented and closed. I guess a path is always oriented, maybe even. So then you can define the signed area by just saying, okay, well, for each square, just see what the, like, it doesn't matter which point you you choose in the square, it's gonna have the same winding number. Just see what the winding number of the curve around that square is, and then just add them all up. So for example, for this square, if you draw a ray out here, that's one clockwise, one counterclockwise. So this is uh, zero. For this one, this is one. So all these are one, et cetera. And like this one is two. And these are all two. And I won't, so you, that, then you add up all those numbers. And this gives you the signed area of a path on a unit squared grid. And so now we know enough to um, uh, leverage this to get another invariant. So now this is the exact same slide that I had before, and almost the exact same proof of the fact that you're going to get a closed path in Manhattan works to say, okay, a closed. of, well, I guess maybe in closing. Closing signed area zero. And actually, and again, it's like sort of like a weird proof where it's like, it's just sort of, uh, you like kind of look at it the right way and it's obvious or something. Um, again, like, so the base case, we already showed it because we just looked at like, you know, well, it, uh, we looked at one tile, we have to look at it in many orientations. And then for the induction step, we do the same sort of thing where we break it down. Go here and here, then go back, then go up here. And we know that when you go along from here to here, that's area zero. And when you go, that's area zero. But the thing is like this, 
little thing in here doesn't affect the signed area at all. And one way you can see that is to say, well, any ray, like which passes through those things, like whatever effect this has, this is going to cancel it out. And another thing to say is like, well, if you walk along a path and then like retrace your steps, you're just not enclosing any area. This has no effect on the area. Okay, so now uh, that's what we need. Like we've already done this dry again, but we can look at it now and say, let's do the same thing again. We walk along the path here. And our Manhattan friend is going to, uh, let me start here, walk along the same path. And then we say, okay, well, um, this path, this region is not zero, it's 16. So therefore it can't be tiled by two tetrominoes. And that kind of completes the proof for our sample problem. And now what we want to do is actually use almost exactly the same proof technique for the triangle problem. Uh, and I wonder if you, can you guys see, like if I was just to start saying, okay, I'm gonna use the exact same thing for the triangle problem. Do you know, like, like what's an immediate problem which might trip me up? It's like not square, it's like triangle. So. Yeah, yeah, right, it's not square, it's, yeah. it's triangle. Um, so yeah, this is actually like um, surprisingly easy, at least surprisingly easy to me to, to solve. So what they do is they just push everything, they've left justify everything. So they just like push everything over and say, okay, well, I'm just gonna move everything over here. So this thing, which used to be, you know, so this used to be the triangle grid, this all gets pushed over. This guy here used to be this. This one used to be uh, this. This one used to be this. And so, yeah, they just left justify everything. And so, okay, well, great. Now it's not as symmetric and it's not like, now with this framing, you would say like, why on earth do you have like this tile? And like, I don't know, this one's not as symmetric. Um, but it's the same problem. Okay, so let's, cool, let's just do it. So let's start by um, doing the first tile. So here, we're gonna do this three by one rectangle up here. Hold this, okay. And then our Manhattan friend is gonna say, okay, walk three blocks along the street with the traffic walk one block uh, on an avenue against the traffic, which is this way, walk three blocks against the traffic on a street, which is this way, and walk one block against the traffic on an avenue. Uh, so the avenue here would be going, so walk one block against the traffic on an avenue. So the avenue should be going, uh, oh yeah, wait, so it's like this, wait, did I make Three blocks. Oh, this should have been. Oh, sorry. This one was. Let me say. This one is with the traffic. So, let me think. so it, it's actually it's not going to work, but I want it to not work in the right way. Okay, let me try this again. So three now with the traffic. Now three against the traffic. Now th one against the traffic, which is this way. Okay, so yeah, so it didn't work. Not only did it like not have signed area zero, it didn't even close up. Um, and so this shows that Manhattan actually was carefully designed to prove um, facts about skewed tetrominoes, but not designed to prove facts about triangle tilings. If we wanna prove facts about triangle tilings, our Manhattan friend is gonna have to um, move to a different city. And so the city she wants to move to is the city of Manhexagon, which is a significantly more um, creatively designed city than Manhattan is. So I copied this map of Manhexagon from a paper where for some weird reason I used the letters X and Y. They meant to say Street and Avenue. It's like some weird typo or something, I don't know. So they meant Street and Avenue. And um, how does it work? It doesn't even like look like a real thing, like a real map. So the way that Manhexagon works is that, uh, so all these triangular regions are labeled either street or avenue. So there's a street region, a street region, a street region. If you wanna travel along a street, you must travel 
adjacent to this uh, street region. And if you want to travel along an avenue, you must travel adjacent to an avenue region. And then if you want to travel with the traffic, you follow the orientation of these lines. So let me give you an example. Here, Hoboken is the same as it was before. So suppose like you just like start in Hoboken and you just like go like, okay, well, I'm just going to travel a hundred blocks with the traffic along a street. So then your um, Manhexican friend say that she is starting here. Oops. Starting here. So she says, okay, well, I've got to travel one block along the street. Okay, so this is the, this is the street region here. So let me go one block along a street. Now I have to go another block along a street. So because the orientation is like this, she goes over here. And now she goes another block along the street. And because the orientation is like this, she goes here. And she actually just winds around this, you know, however many times you went divided by three. So Manhattan is a weird place. Yeah, but it's, it's yeah. Jonah wants to know, how did people come up with a diagram like this for Manhexigan? Oh uh, yeah, so, um, so this presentation with Hoboken and um, Manhattan was in a paper by James Prop. Uh, I will tell you that the name Manhexigan I came up with for this talk, so it's an exclusive for the U of M Math Club. But what he was doing was taking the, um, the paper of Conway Ligarius, which used this thing called group theory, which you might know something about if you were at well, you know, many ways, but Drew, Drew Armstrong talked about it a few weeks ago. And it's like couched in the language of group theory. And he sort of read this and said, well, like there's some core here that um, doesn't use group theory uh, that he can extract. But if you want to know how he came up with it, how Conway and Gary came up with it, you both have to know group theory, but even if you know group theory, it's like not, you still have to be clever. You construct a group which is related to the tiles and related to um, uh, the grid system which you're using, like related to like, in this case, the square root of Hoboken. And then you construct a group from that and you kind of like have to look at the structure of that group and you can like say, oh, this structure is kind of like, has this weird property. So there's still like definitely some cleverness involved, but it's not as totally out of the blue. I mean, it's still a little bit out of the blue. It's not as totally out of the blue as the way I'm saying it here, where it's just like, well, here's a, here's a thing. Like this just solved all your problems. Um, so, yeah. Okay, uh, so as I, whoa, as I alluded to, this is gonna solve all, our problem, solve all our problems. So let's just examine one thing. So if we take the, uh, just the first path. So what is our friend in Manhattan, uh, excuse me, Manhattan gonna do? Um, so she starts here, say, so she goes three blocks along the street. Now she goes one block along an avenue. Now she goes three blocks against the traffic on a street, which is like this. And then she goes one avenue back. So good, so this closed up. And furthermore, it gave us the same thing that we wanted um, because it encircled this region once counterclockwise. Wait, no, encircled this region. Uh, sorry, I drew the wrong arrow. once clockwise and this region once kind of clockwise so it has signed area zero and you can just carry out this and you'll see wait hey the thing just works just like magic um so here is uh, a copy and paste from the paper because i didn't do it myself so this is these two are the two um three in a row tiles one's horizontal, one's vertical. I'm not sure which is which, but it doesn't matter so much. And this is the tile uh, like this. So when you're traveling kind of down this staircase, it goes around one hexagon. And when you're traveling up the staircase, it goes around the other one in the opposite orientation. And then this is um, the full region, which is a staircase sort of thing. And so when you're going down here, you're going around here nine times. Wait, boop, boop, boop. When you're going over here, uh, you are going around this one nine times. And then when you're going up the staircase, you're going around a hexagon three times. And all these have the same orientation. They're all negatively oriented. 
So uh, that's it. And because of the, the genius of Manhexagon city planners, the problem is, uh, is solved. I have a question. And so that's basically, oh yeah, sorry. For any Go like ahead. set of tiles, can you create like a man tile again? Or like, you know, um, you, uh, I think not. So, um, so you can create this group that Conway and Ligarius uh, define in their paper. And whether or not you can create a man tile again for the group depends on whether or not so like there's this uh, object like a calligraph that you can find for this group and it depends on whether or not it's planar. You might be able to do something. So this actually leads into my next slide where on my next and final slide, no, second to last um, slide. I have a question I, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so how would you define a similar alternating hexagon if it's necessary? Similar alternating. Oh, um, hmm. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I guess. I mean, you could, I suppose, just reverse these arrows, but I'm not sure what properties that would have. Like, I feel like that's symmetric enough to be something interesting, but I don't know what it would be interesting for. So, in summary, I don't know. I feel like it's probably something. Um, yeah, so, yeah, sure. So after this paper, so Bill Thurston also wrote a paper about this. And um, by, by the way, I'm full disclosure, I didn't, read, I didn't actually read all of like either the Conway Ligarius paper or the Thurston paper. So um, I don't know everything about it, but I want to, I read some of it and I wanted to include a, a slide, uh, a figure from it, because this is shows like the Borg future of these arguments where you have Manhattan looming over Hoboken, just hovering in space while you walk around Hoboken. And this is actually like, this is a little bit of a joke because it's actually like, Thurston's doing like a bit of a different argument than what I just described. But it is similar in that like, you walk around here and that gets lifted up to a, a kind of cubical surface that you're also traveling around. Um, but I will not take any questions about that because I don't understand it. And yeah, that's my talk. So these are the references. So this is the one that I mentioned, which, so this is the guy who actually came up with the kind of Hoboken Manhattan phrasing. Um, this is, uh, so these two things, neither of these use group theory. These are both elementary. These ones both use group theory. This is actually just a really cool book in general. This is like 30 chapters about just cool stuff in math. And I actually think it's like just kind of awesome. Uh, this is the paper I've been talking about the whole time. And this is kind of Thurston's extension of it. Um, and that's, that's my talk. Thank you. All right, Mike, thanks a lot. Free class, yay, that was awesome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so open the floor for questions. You can use the chat, you can uh, unmute and ask your question. Mike will hang out for a bit and, and answer any questions y'all have. Actually, can you give me like one second? Because I want to, um, I have a really awkward setup. I want to switch back to using my iPad because oh, sure, 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 it's sure. really weird to use my iPhone. Okay. Okay. You're taking a, a couple seconds break. In the meantime, can we see your cat, Sarah? Okay, he's right here, <laughs> right, in, right in front. Here, Thomas will say hello. Oh, hi, oh, so cute. There he is. He doesn't really move very much, so he's kind of like right here. Oh, now he's like, okay, it's <laughs> getting a little bit. This is Thomas. Okay, I think I'm back. Oh, shoot, I didn't realize the recording was still going. <laughs> 